those of you who are uh, at a remote location, at the end when we get into the kind of question and answer phase, can submit questions via Facebook and Twitter uh, at Oak Ridge Lab News. Uh, so uh, this is uh, now the third in, in a series that we kicked off on in November of 2013 um, on the uh, 70th anniversary of the starting of the graphite reactor. Um, so that was when we launched the Eugene P. Wigner Distinguished Lecture Series in Science, Technology, and Policy. Uh, this series has been organized by our corporate fellows to invigorate scientific discovery, spur technological innovation, and initiate productive scientific policy debate. And, of course, the lecture honors Eugene Wigner, who uh, uh, played a, an important role in the early development of Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, he actually trained as a chemical engineer, um, although his interests were broad and many, and he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1963 for, for work on uh, fundamental symmetries and their impact on atomic theory. Um, he was also one of the founders of the field of nuclear engineering and, and really, I think, a role model for the coupling of basic and applied work. And, of course, this was visible in uh, some of the planning that he did as the uh, first research director of Oak Ridge National Lab. Actually, at the time, it was called Clinton Laboratories uh, in 1946 and 1947 when he was tasked with laying out the strategy uh, for this new institution that came into being as a consequence of the Manhattan Project and, and really, um, in a certain sense, um, did what we now do on a regular basis in terms of laboratory planning and strategic planning. Um, but at that time, you could even argue that that was also the invention of yet another new field that he played a role in, which was uh, sort of strategic planning for a national lab. Um, our lecturer today is uh, Professor Steve Chu, and uh, actually he's got several things in common with Eugene Wigner. Uh, he, he also was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1997. Um, he served as a laboratory director uh, at Lawrence Berkeley Lab between 2004 and 2009, uh, and also was a university professor uh, at, at both Stanford and at, at UC Berkeley during his tenure at LBNL. Uh, in addition, he worked in industry at Bell Labs from 1978 to 1987, but probably he's best known to most of the people uh, here today uh, in his role as the longest-serving Secretary of Energy from January 2009 to April 2013. And during his tenure, uh, he launched a number of new initiatives, uh, and some of that has had an, an impact here. Obviously, the energy innovation hubs, and, and we have been successful in, uh, in some of the proposals that we've been involved in there around the energy innovation hubs, uh, and, and also um, the establishment of, of ARPA-E, and of course the last speaker in this series was Arun Majumdar, who was the kind of inaugural director of ARPA-E. Um, in, in the case of ARPA-E, Steve played a, a role in both ends of the process because he was on the committee that actually recommended the creation of such a thing and then had the misfortune to be the recipient of his own advice and became responsible for establishing it. So you always need to be careful what recommendations you give uh, because you never know. You may wind up being on the receiving end. Um, during his tenure at DOE, he presided over a doubling of the deployment of re renewable energy in the U.S. Uh, solar energy deployment actually increased about an order of magnitude. And, of course, much of that was enabled through uh, some of the Recovery Act investment, which was quite substantial uh, in DOE. Um, of course, you, you, you don't always get to work on the things you're going to work on when you undertake a new job. So uh, there were some interesting unplanned events that came along uh, during his tenure at DOE, uh, including... Uh, the Deepwater Horizon oil leak, and then, uh, at the direction of President Obama, uh, he played a role in, in, in leading a team that was assisting BP in actually stopping that. And uh, another one of those um, sort of all hands on deck moments came uh, with the uh, Fukushima event, with the, with the tsunami damaged reactors and the 
uh, effort on the part of the U.S. government to develop an understanding of, of exactly what was going on at the time when solid information was very scarce. Uh, so uh, today uh, he comes to us as the William R. Keenan Professor of Physics and Professor of Molecular and Cellular Physiology at Stanford, um, where he has returned to teaching and research and is turning his attention to biophysics, biomedicine, energy, and ec energy economics. And um, there's a long list here of honors in addition to the Nobel Prize, and, and uh, I'd rather listen to him talk, so I won't read this long list. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Chu. So, so thank you, Tom. I have to a little more story about RPE. So I was on this committee. Um, there are three seats down here <laughs> and another one back there in case I'm back. Uh, I was on this committee chaired by Norm Augustine called Rising Above the Gathering Storm. And when it came time to try to sell the report to various people, I was asked um, by the academies, by the committee, to go before the House Science Committee and uh, try to sell them an RPE. And they wanted, you know, countervailing views. Uh, and um, at the end, it was decided after two hours you know, they, they had some flaws. It was modeled after DARPA. DARPA had a customer, the military. Uh, there was no customer for RPE except the pri eventually the private sector and things like that. But at the end of two and a half hours or two hours, it was decided if it's going to work if you get the right people, it's not going to work if you don't get the right people. Very wise. <laughs> um, and so then after that, uh, I was sent to the Department of Energy to try to, to talk Sam Bodman into uh, embracing it. But at that time, the um, people in the Office of Science were very suspicious that if you allowed an applied research program into the Office of Science, they would take over the Office of Science and it would, be, uh, it would doom basic research. Uh, so they just more, didn't want anything to do with it. And because of that, Sam said, okay, I'm, I, I'm not going to do this. And so um, it was never embraced by the uh, Department of Energy. And when the new De Secretary of Energy came in, he had a very different attitude. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and Arun Majumdar was my first and only choice. Uh, I got to know him when I was a lab director. I and my deputy Paul Vasados, um, even though he had not been a department head, he had been such a sterling scientist and has such a wonderful way about him that we decided to promote him to lead a division with a budget of $90 million, from a PI to $90 million. And he did spectacularly well there. And so when I came to, and it wasn't even his main, he's a material scientist in, in uh, thermal connectivity and thermal devices. And when I came to the Department of Energy, uh, I said, Arun, you've got to come here. He said, I can't. I have two daughters, one in high school, one in junior high school. They have to be here. So he said, well, just come here. And I said, well, if I, can you, the government pay me to go back every third weekend? I said, we can't do that. Oh, by the way, you have to resign your tenure position, but you should come here anyway. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> uh, so he and I, two kind of dumb people. Anyway, uh, and we had a lot of fun together, and he was absolutely spectacular. The people he and we hired were also spectacular. So let me talk about what I'm supposed to talk about, but I also should tell you that for two or three years before I became director of Berkeley Lab, they would invite me to give talks on physics and bi biophysics and biology, and I would start slipping in more and more about climate change. So now that I've been invited to give a talk on climate change and something, like that, I'm going to slip in some stuff about science. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm serious about it. Uh, and then I was prodded by uh, Ramesh uh, to say, no, they'd love to hear even more about the science. So instead of talking five minutes about the science, you're going to get 60% science. OK, so I'm right now uh, gone back to Stanford. I have an appointment in the medical school and in physics. And I'm working in um, 
neurosignaling, how neurons talk to one another at a molecular scale. I'm working on biofilms and working on cancer signaling. Uh, the things I won't talk about, but only indicate that there are these so-called super-resolution microscope techniques, and we want to not only use them in the visible and the near IR, but we also want to apply them to the mid-IR. This is the so-called molecular footprint regime, uh, and are shooting for something like 40 nanometer resolution, even though the wavelength is 3 to 11 microns. And we're applying really crazy ideas to cancer and chronic infections. And so let me begin with what's been happening in optical microscopy. So there are a number of groups. The two prominent groups were Eric Betts, Harold Hess, formerly Bell Labs, now Janelia Farms, and independently Xiao Wei Zhang at Harvard, uh, developed the following technique. If you look at a little dot of light from a fluorescent molecule in an optical microscope of the highest resolution, the point spread function, the width of that blob, would be somewhere around 300 nanometers. It could be as small as 250, but order 300 nanometers. And so if you had a bunch of these blobs together, too close together, you know, there, you, there's a Rayleigh criterion that says you can't tell the difference between two blobs and one blob. But if you ask a different question, you ask, I see a single blob, and where's the center of that blob? Uh, it's there. Depends on the signal to noise. If the width is 300 nanometers and the signal to noise is 100 to 1, you should be able to find that to 100th of the width, 3 nanometers. Okay, so that fluorescent molecule you spot it, flashes for about a second, it photo bleaches, but you know where it is. Then you find another blob, another center, another blob, another center, another blob, another center. And you build up the image piecemeal. And in doing so, you can do far better than the um, optical resolution of the microscope. But when this first was introduced in 2006, and the inventors plus a number of other people, including myself, jumped on it immediately, and we said, wait a minute, there's something strange. And the something strange is uh, no one was better doing better than localization of 15 nanometers. We knew how many photons we were detecting, so we know what the shot noise limit should have been. But instead, it was, uh, it was worse than the shot noise limit. So we asked ourselves, can we do better? And the answer is, uh, yes, we can. Uh, so this is the work of Alex Alexandros Persinidis, who is now uh, an assistant professor at Sloan Kettering. And uh, it's also assisted by Yung Chang Zhang, a graduate student of mine, who is now a postdoc at Stanford. And it's very simple. You take an image of a fluorescent molecule, and you adjust the optics so that image is only a few pixels wide. So let's, OK, here's a pointer. Uh, why only a few pixels wide? Because you want the best signal to noise, so you want this thing to pop out above any electronic noise or any background noise. And also, uh, you need at least one or two or three pixels so you can find the center of that. So you generally fit this to a Gaussian curve. OK, so there's the center of the curve. But what if one of the pixels is off by a little bit? For example, this pixel has a little bit higher sensitivity. Since you're fitting the center of the curve to 1 50th of a pixel, you will shift. But that 1% off is built into their CCD array. So we immediately suspected that might be it. So then we did something, in hindsight, quite simple. We took a little pinpoint dot of light on a microscope stage, and it gets imaged by the microscope objective and put onto a CCD array. And we take a precision encoded microscope translator, PZT driver, and we move it a nanometer. And the spot moves a nanometer. We find the center of the spot. We move in another nanometer. We find the center by another nanometer, OK? But instead of marching across in a regular way, this thing kind of jerks across, OK? So we back calculate. We know what the delta should have been, but it wasn't. It got shifted a little bit. Well, then you just write that into a computer program. You come back the next day and see if it's the same, and it is. You go to the same set of pixels, it's the same. It's baked into the array. So you make that correction. And if you make that correction, well, you get the shot noise limit. And so what that meant is an experiment of 10 repeated dyes on DNA molecules. So you can build up to a million detected photons. We got to a resolution 
of about five angstroms, except it's in wet, and it's an optical microscope. Okay, so it's about 20 times, 30 times better than um, uh, before. Of course, we submitted that to Nature. Uh, this is the best work before that, and we had uh, uh, literally um, five, maybe even 10 times better. But um, uh, the referees in Nature are saying, yeah, but where's the biology? You didn't do any biology. You just improved resolution by 30, uh, but so what? Mm. So we threw in a little biology. And <laughs> um, anyway, it's very typical of science in nature. And um, so we did this on a system of DNA dyes on DNA, very known system. We knew exactly. And to an absolute resolution, no adjustable parameters. We were good to about 0.8 nanometers. All right, let me show you how some of this stuff works. This is my second to last postdoc. Um, he worked on biofilms. Uh, what's a biofilm? Well, if bacteria invade your body, they can be existing as free individual cells. But sometimes they want to hunker down on the surface and build a little fortress. And by fortress, I mean they begin to exude proteins that help glue them on the surface. But more importantly, many of the other proteins glue themselves together and form a protective shell against antibodies from the organism, against microphages, against everything else. And so this is a sideways view of a live-growing biofilm. And what we did is we were able to take antibodies with a fluorescent dye, and as these biofilms were growing, if they land on the surface of the bacteria, specifically to the protein we're targeting, they light up for a little while and they photobleach. And another one lands and lights for a while and photobleaches. And in that, we can form an image. So what kind of image do you see? Well, these bacteria are cholera bacteria. They're pretty small. They're less than a micron in uh, diameter. So, so this is 200 nanometers. So you get a kind of a fuzzy blob when you see it in a conventional fluorescent microscope. This is what you see uh, in the super resolution. And that little dotted thing, that's the blow up. And so these are proteins being exuded from the bacteria surface that are helping it stick together. So as you can tell, that factor of 20 matters. It, it, it's a totally different thing. This is getting comparable to electron microscopy, of scanning electron microscopy, but it's in wet and it's alive. That's the only difference. Um, now, once you see the structure of the biofilm, I really believe what Yogi Berra said many times. You know, the great American philosopher of the 20th century said, you can learn a lot by, you can, you can see a lot by watching. Um, so I get this email from uh, my postdoc, I'm Secretary of Energy. So he has to email me, you know, like midnight on Sunday and stuff like that. But um, uh, he can email me anytime. Uh, I can read it Monday, <laughs> midnight. Uh, but anyway, he says, I've been plotting histograms of these gaps between the bacteria. And the, the gap is, has a very narrow spread in histograms, but the length seems to be, you know, if I just go to the longest and shortest axis, he was just doing this statistically, the length seems to have huge variation. So I said, okay, Basil, let's go back to the picture. Go back to the picture. He says, Basil, those are circulation channels. These are bacteria. They have no heart, no arteries. They have to grow in a way that they're one aisle away from diffusion of nutrients in and waste out. Got to be. And, and it's remarkable. They, the biofilms, these are bacteria. What did bacteria do? They grow by splitting. And so remarkably, the bacteria in the center of the biofilm don't split anymore. They, they've learned to slow down their splitting. It's only at the edge. Uh, but they've learned also to grow, so they have all these channels. Immediately suggests... Uh, a possible way to attack biofilms. Get some antibody or something that recognizes the proteins. Then you get something else, a monomer, some polymers, that can optically cross-link, you know, mild UV. <clears throat> you just make it all, and what does it do? It, it starts to close down the circulation channels. So think of it this way. The bacteria have formed a fort. They've hunkered down because they're being attacked by the defense mechanisms of the body. 
And the fort's pretty impenetrable. You can't storm the fort. They do no good. So what do you do? You lay siege. You starve them out. And what happens is if the biofilms get a little bit antsy, they actually excrete out of their cells something else. They excrete a protease that chews up the cement hard wall, and then they take flight. But once they take flight, it's like the soldiers escaping the fort, you can pick them off with antibodies. So we will be trying this and see if it works. All chronic infections are due to biofilms. It's pretty serious stuff. I had a friend of mine had biofilm infection in her lungs. Eventually, after trying to deal with it years and years and years, they excised parts of, two parts of, and either part of her lung. It's a serious problem. Uh, you do not want to get a biofilm infection in an implant or in a joint because you could lose that joint. All right, we're also going to do a little neurotransmission axons. Neurons talk to other neurons. They talk by sending voltage spikes down a long transmission line called an axon. When these voltage spikes get to the end, they actually open up calcium channels. And let's see if I can have a more detailed view of this. The voltage spikes come down. They open up calcium channels. The calcium channels spray calcium onto a set of proteins that are binding a bag of neurotransmitters near the cell wall. Some magic happens. These neurotransmitters, then this vesicle made of cell wall material, fuses to the outer cell wall of the neuron and it releases neurotransmitters. So that's the cartoon. Uh, this is, uh, these are my collaborators. I've been working on vesicle fusion using these so-called snare proteins with Axel Brunger for the last uh, 12 years. And uh, we've been recently joined in the last two years by Tom Sudoff. And this is an electron micrograph. This is the axon with the vesicles, with the neurotransmitters. This is the dendrite. This little thin sliver is the synapse. This is 100 nanometers, so this is of scale 30 nanometers. The real size of this connection, the synapse, is about a micron. And so um, in late September, I said to Axel, I've got a idea, I think we can figure out how to see these vesicles being made and fused when they fuse uh, in a live neuron, in a live uh, neuron slice uh, connected with other neurons, so a tissue slice, uh, by using dyes that can be incorporated in the edges and also uh, dyes or nanoparticles on the inside. And when they fuse, the dyes would light up because there's a change in pH. Uh, and we also want to look at the chemical changes on the postsynaptic side because when these neurotransmitters go over there, they induce long-term chemical changes that we believe is associated with so-called long-term potentiation uh, memory. And on the presynaptic side, that's because if you use it enough, you build it more, you uh, fire this junction enough, you build up these chemical changes, and that's how you remember, so the theory goes. But on the other side, um, there is an uh, a sort of a numbing, uh, an inhibition, and we think it's because you use up vesicles. The scale of these vesicles is about 50 nanometers. So we need super resolution, but we think we can see these to about 10 nanometers, even in a live cell. So I was explaining this to Tsam Tsudov. You know, he's a master of neural tissue and things. And I said to him, you know, if this works, we can all get famous. And uh, two weeks later, he gets his Nobel Prize. And so, so the only poor person left in this group who doesn't have one, uh, but he was mentioned in Tom's Nobel Prize because he, he formed this, found the structures for the molecules that Tom uh, got his Nobel Prize for. But what we'd like to do is actually take, uh, again, in super resolution, both in the visible on this side, in the infrared on this side, to look at the chemical changes without labels, to see how it really works. And once we have that system, we can start stimulating the neurons, finding what the thresholds are, and just go to town. It's an experimental platform. All right, so another thing we're doing is cancer signaling. This is my second to last postdoc, now a professor at Oregon State University. Also worked with Joe Gray, who is an associate lab director uh, and a golfing buddy at LBNL. 
And then we also enlisted the help of Frank McCormick, who was also a cancer specialist at UCSF. Okay, so here's, here's a movie, and I hope uh, this, this is kind of intro biology. So to the physicists in the audience, don't panic at the names. I know as soon as you see a weird name, you freeze. <laughs> Try not to. They just think of it as, you know, Jim or Bob or Alice. Um, and this is a movie made by Genetic Tech of how signals decide whether they're going to proliferate, how, how, how a cell will decide uh, whether it's going to divide or not. It is considered totally antisocial if a cell just divides, divides, divides. Uh, it's called cancer. Uh, when your, your cell's embedded in tissue in organisms, they're just not supposed to divide like crazy. Okay? So it's controlled by outside signaling events. Recruitment and, and activation of signaling molecules of this pathway which include RAS, RAF, MEC, and ERG, also known as MAPK. MAPK signaling is activated through bi- So the signaling molecule is this thing called a ligand. It just means small molecule. And the receptor are two parts that are separated. And you will notice this receptor molecule on the outside of the cell actually goes through the cell membrane and has some stuff on the inside, and similar here. And you'll watch as this this signaling molecule lands on one part of the receptor. It stimulates the other part of the receptor to get together and continue. Ending of a growth factor to the extracellular domain of the tyrosine kinase receptor. Signal signaling molecules GR. So you notice that they got together, this gets together. And these two ends, when they get together, they, they allow a PO4, a phosphate group, to attach to it. When that phosphate group is attached to it, it allows two other molecules called GRB2 and SOS to also attach to it. They too get phosphorylated. And so the saga continues. B2 and SOS are next recruited to the internal docking site. And then there's a membrane protein called RAS that floats around the membrane. Uh, these GRB2s and SOS, they're floating around the cytosol. Phosphorylation, phosphorylation, phosphorylation. This guy sees these phosphorylated groups of molecules, drifts in there, grabs onto them, and at that state, it gets into what's called a GTP-activated state, guanine triphosphate. It means there are two units of fuel in biology. One is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. The fuel is you break a phosphate bond and you make it ADP, and the energy of the phosphate bond is used to do some mechanical work or chemical work. And the other unit of fuel, common unit of fuel, is GTP, which you break to form GDP. When these things get phosphorylated, it, it enables this molecule to go into the charged energy up state. When it's in the energy up state, it can take another molecule. Uh, Resulting in RAS activation at the membrane. Called RAF. The efficiency and duration of signal transmission is regulated by the scaffolding protein kinase suppressor of RAS, KSR. RAS triggers a phosphorylation cascade involving RAF, MEC, and ERK proteins, leading to ERK activation and translocation to the nucleus. So this guy goes into Once the in nucleus. Once in the nucleus, ERK activates several transcription factors that mediate gene expression. Target genes thus act. Okay, so that goes in the nucleus, and the cell says divide. It's okay to divide. So that's, that's the mechanism. And uh, let me play it to you again more slowly. The receptor on the outside of the cell gets this ligand, and it attracts two other proteins. They get phosphorylated, plus the receptor gets phosphorylated. They activate this molecule called RAS, once RAS is activated in an energy charge state, it goes and finds these other molecules, RAF, MEC, and ERK, and they too get phosphorylated. Now, why am I telling you this? If in this pathway there are mutations of RAS and there are mutations of RAF, and the mutations of RAS uh, are associated over half of all human cancers, 90% of pancreatic cancer, two-thirds of multiple myeloma, and so it's on the line. So this particular pathway and its mutations have gotten a lot of interest because many, many human cancers are associated with it. If you can develop a drug that can target only the mutant form of RAS, 
then that's good because the chances of side effects are much lower. Uh, a drug was developed to target only the mutant form of RAF, and uh, that was a big success story. The way it worked is if you have a mutant form of RAF, which is indicated by this cartoon in pink, and you add a small drug indicating this cartoon with the very sexy name Plexicon 4032, uh, it will prevent, the conjecture was these two molecules actually form pairs. And when they form pairs, they went down the signaling channel, and they don't need an outside signal. They don't need that outside ligand to land on the, the receptor molecule, the uh, terracine kinase. So this small molecule landing on only the mutant molecule performs, prevents these from forming pairs. Therefore, the tumors shrink and die. And that's precisely what happened. The drug is called Zelberoff, and perhaps you've heard about it. It treats malignant melanoma. Um, after a year or so, it comes back, but um, there are some new therapies that are combining this small molecule drug with a downregulation of this next molecule, and it seems to have much better results. So we may be on to a cure for metastasized malignant melanoma, which before was fatal. Um, what about RAS? So what we did is uh, we last year published a paper on RAF and proceeds in the National Academy showing that it's indeed a dimer. Uh, but in but in RAF, um, we were to do something a little different. Suppose this is the cancer gene. And so you put normally you put in you want to express this gene in a cell, and you put in a strong promoter, and it makes a lot of the gene. But we're going to use another molecular biology trick using a um, tetracycline antibiotic that acts as a valve by diffusing in small amounts of this so-called DOX. Uh, it can land on the promoter, and depending on the dosage of the small molecule we induce in the cell, you can make as little or as much of this gene as you want. So it can be dialed up and down. And you'll see in a while why that's important. As with RAF, RAS uh, was believed to be forming clusters. And if it forms clusters, that clustering would mean you can get some downstream signaling. That's the hypothesis. Without the outside signal. So that's where the cancer is. No outside signal, still downstream signaling, still cell division. And this is the evidence. They stained uh, antibodies with gold particles. Uh, the gold particles um, were like 60, 80 nanometer gold particles, and they took an electron micrograph of this. Uh, this is the resolution. This is 100 nanometers. And uh, they found, you know, if you tile this image, they're different size tiles, and you, look, and you look at first the average density in each tile, and if there's clustering you at, at a certain size of tile, you will form abnormally more in that size. And if you go to bigger tiles, it will fade away. If you go to smaller size, if the cluster size is this big, a tile this big won't see it, a tile this big won't see it. So it's a statistical way of seeing clustering. And what they found is that there seemed to be clustering around 25 nanometers. But uh, in the, those in the early papers, and they went back in the later papers and discovered what we knew in the single molecule world for about a decade. When you overexpress proteins, they cluster. It's an artifact. So we didn't really know, and that was always a suspicion with the other uh, work, you don't really know whether too many of the protein, even whether it's normal or diseased, uh, they just normally cluster. So we did this with our um, single molecule stuff. And we can see individual fluorescent dots. And this is, again, 100 nanometers. And you notice there's a difference in signal to noise. Um, uh, at a certain dosage of DOX, one nanogram per milliliter, you see individual molecules. There's no sign of any clustering. And we can actually count singles, doubles, triples. This is, in blue is the number of singles, doubles, triples. This is in the noise. When we increase the dosage of dots, so in this dosage, it's nonlinear, so it's about seven times more dots here than here, you can actually see pairs directly because the resolution 
is 10 nanometers. So, so if they're 25 nanometers apart, they show up as a pair. Okay, so this is Yogi Berra's philosophy. And uh, the statistical test says there's clustering, again, around the same spot. But the number of pairs, uh, this is the singles, the pairs, the triples, and so the number of pairs uh, as a certain density. Okay, so now they're forming pairs. But the important question is, is the downstream signaling turning on the growth? So here is, you see us all the time in science circles. Um, again, don't be scared about this. I'll walk you through it. This is Doc's concentration, 0, plus 5, half, 1, 2, 3. And this is the KRAS, a molecule that's um, n the normal wild-type non-cancerous form of KRAS. And so this is this concentration. And this is the fluorescently labeled mutant cancer form of KRAS. And as we dial up this concentration, you see you get it to express more and more of this protein. You notice as more and more of this protein gets expressed, the wild type goes down. So there appears to be something in the cell that says, I don't really want a certain amount of RAS in my cell. And so if you make me make more of this, I'm going to make less of that. We don't understand why, but it's true in all our gel shifts. Here's the cool part. Phosphorylation of ERK was considered, that's the signal that goes into the nucleus, background, 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 between one and two, oops, phosphorylation, and higher phosphorylation. So this is where the signaling occurs. At this density of pairs, you've just turned on the signal to divide. It was 60 times lower than the previous AM sensitivity. So we do something else. Here's the RAS molecule on the membrane. Here's the fluorescent dye. It's a protein that folds up into a red fluorescent dye. And then we add a few more peptides at the end. So these RASs are in the cell membrane. So this is the cell membrane. These things are kind of wobbling around. And we induce another small drug, a dimerizing agent. And this yellow guy locks into here. So they're flopping around like this, and then there's a dimerizing agent that lumps them, and it keeps this and locks this in place, and then these guys can flop around and come together. So we force the RAS to dimerize. And we force the RAS to dimerize at DOCS concentration of 0, 1, 2, with and without dimerizing agent. So again, as we go 0, 1, 2, you see that the K RAS is ticked up. But look what happens at the concentration where we were seeing no phosphorylation, this is seven times lower concentration, you force it to dimerize, and you get the cancer signal. So we've shown that dimerization is necessary. We've shown it's sufficient. Another experiment shows GTP activation is necessary. So what's necessary and sufficient is GTP activation, dimerization at a certain concentration. And you only need dimers and it's a very low concentration. Those two things, you get the cancer signaling. So by doing a bunch of experiments, you begin to completely understand what goes wrong with the signaling pathway, and then immediately it suggests an opportunity. Um, these are membrane proteins. We also did another side experiment. We impeded the ability of the membrane protein to stick on the membrane. No more dimerization, no more signaling, no more anything. So there's a number of things that we can do to impede just the mutant form to dimerize. Just the mutant form, if we, take, if we impede its ability to stick on a membrane, it leaves the normal one alone, cells should be happy. Okay? Or just the mutant form, if they go and diffuse to the membrane to keep them from forming a dimer, cells should be happy. So at least there's two opportunities for drug targets very specifically, and where they would be structurally on the cell. So again, uh, doing these simple experiments immediately suggests something. Uh, that's the model. Now, um, I talked, you saw all this phosphorylation I was talking about on the cancer signaling, phosphorylation on the memory of the neuron. And so wouldn't it be cool if you can use mid-IR spectroscopy to detect phosphorylation? So we did a baby experiment uh, published in 2012 using synchrotron radiation, but we'd rather use lasers because I'm a laser jock, and plus 
I hate waiting for beam time. And <laughs> I did an experiment on muonium uh, at KEK, where you get this beam time for a couple, couple of days, and you're up for three days in a row running the experiment. And it's, you know, if something goes wrong and you lose half your beam time, then you go, well, we were actually in with the, the owner of this little thing. <laughs> so we could get our beam time three months later, but usually you'd have to wait a year later. But, but it, it's, it's a hard way to make a living, uh, as people know. Uh, anyway, so we're going to use infrared spectroscopy, either linear spectroscopy using quantum cascade lasers or nonlinear spectroscopy, for example, frequency comb lasers. Um, this is an example. I saw Ted Hench give a talk at Eichels and, and Lindau in Germany where he was using his frequency combs, the thing he got his Nobel Prize for, to start to do infrared spectroscopy. And I said, Ted, that's all fine and good, but it gets really exciting if you can do infrared spectroscopy microscopically and get to microscopic resolution and sub-microscopic resolution. So he did that by combining two near-infrared lasers, two Tau sapphire lasers, focusing them on with an objective onto a sample, and then he's using CARS. This is coherent anti silks Raman scattering. Two frequencies of omega-1, one frequency of omega-2, and you look at the blue-shifted photon. And you sweep in frequency these two lasers, and what's good about this is you get molecular spectra and uh, um, an image about 50 by 50 microns, where the resolution is one micron pixel, uh, uh, in 50 seconds, that's the molecular spectra you can get. It's a big sample because he loaded that one micron, one micron volume with um, uh, lots of uh, chemicals, talcum and other things. But, but this is a, perhaps a way to get very fast um, infrared spectra using these lasers. And then I was reminded of a paper that he, actually he and I published in 1989, many of you may not have been born, he was visiting Stanford, and he said, Steve, you know, you know, with all this tab, you know, is it possible to do optical microscopy and to localize the optical wavelength to lessen the wavelength of light? And, you know, there had already been proposed these little holes, and except when the little holes, the amount of light that gets through goes exponentially down the smaller the hole gets, so it's a losing proposition. So I said, no, well, there's another way to do this, Ted. You can use a transmission line or something like that, because after all, you could have high frequencies or low frequencies in the coaxial cable. The wavelength is it's irrelevant. It's the near field electrodynamics of the electromagnetic field in the transmission line. And so, so I said, oh, OK. So we decided to do the following. We took a little one millimeter diameter coax cable. We uh, took the little point. At the end, the center conductor sharpened a little bit with a file. He hooked it up to a network analyzer, and the RF went down. It's a couple gigahertz, two and a half gigahertz. And then it gets reflected up because this is a horrible impedance match. But it's electromagnetic interactions with a sample would change the phase of the light. Then we compared it with a reference beam. It's a network analyzer. And we looked at the phase shift. All right? That's all it was. And uh, so then we pass this, we put this on a little stage, and we pass it over a 100 micron grid, and we get blip, 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 and said, golly, we have, uh, you know, 30, 40 um, nanom this is 100 mil tenth of a millimeter, so it's 100 uh, nanometers, 100 microns, rather. Uh, so uh, this is 30 micron spatial resolution. So it's lambda over 6,000. Just as a proof of principle, you can do much better. And in that same paper, we said, you know what? You can do this in the infrared. Same deal. And we did a little sketch. So that's what I want to do 30 years later. Uh, this is a different embodiment of it. Uh, it was a collaboration, mostly people from Jilla. Um, oh, that's not the one from Jilla. Oh, I'm sorry. The most recent one was from Jax. Uh, and uh, with Tom Perkins, a former grad student of mine, people from JILA, the person from LBNL uh, on infrared transform spectroscopy. But you're getting the idea that this is 
Uh, they're beginning to look at things at the 2040 nanometer resolution. And so we're busily trying to design something that gives us both super resolution and this, but at this a wide field, not, not just at a single tip. But we'll see if that happens. OK, sorry for the science interlude. <laughs> now I can get down to the main thing. The globe is warming up. Uh, this is a temperature record, 1800-2011. Um, much in Washington has been made about the fact that the climate isn't changing because over the last 10 years, the temperature did not go up, which is true. It plateaued over the last 10 or 12 years. But looking over two centuries, it seems to have gone up. We do not understand this plateau. We do not understand not only this plateau, this slight dip. We do understand over a half a century what's happening. That's called conservation of energy. Uh, if the energy coming in is the same and the energy going out is less because of a greenhouse gas effect, then all the subtle ocean current air mixing things kind of wash out. So, so that's one thing to remember. Another thing to remember is most of that temperature increase occurred over the last, I don't know, three and a half decades uh, from 1980 and beyond. So I can show you things, anecdotal evidence, like Muir Glacier in Alaska in August in 1941 looks different than it does in 2004. I could point out there's anomalous heat waves. There was a heat wave in Europe in 2003 that killed 40 to 52,000 people, uh, and uh, that was pretty serious. But that's one-offs. So let's look at um, a 30-year record or 32-year record. And so, and let's let's not have environmentalists look at it. Let's have green eye shades people look at it. And so these green eye shades people are the reinsurance company Munich Re. A reinsurance company is a company that insures insurance companies. Insurance companies have to take out insurance if there's a massive flood or hurricane or whatever because they won't have enough premiums to pay for the losses. <clears throat> okay, the brown down here is the number of earthquakes. This is the number of storms. These are the numbers of floods or mass movements. These are extreme droughts, forest fires, crop failures. This is only a partial year. So aside from earthquakes, Everything else seems to be trending upward. This is the number of extreme events, those things that would trigger insurance losses. Uh, the amount of losses, uh, both insured in the dark blue and uninsured in the green, are also increasing. And trend line is about uh, $200 billion in the US. But these don't really cover all the losses. They only cover what we call insurance losses. In Hurricane Sandy, your small business in Staten Island or Newark, many small businesses went out of business because they didn't have enough insurance. And the insurance companies always will drag their feet in paying premiums no matter what. And their doors would be closed for a month or two. And if that's true, this since they're living hand to mouth, they go out of business. And that's what happened. When, so when the small business goes out of business, it's not an insurance loss. Okay, the weatherization of the New York subway system Weatherization of the electrical system underground lower Manhattan, about $10 billion, first estimate. That's not an insurance loss. Weatherization of the levees around New Orleans, about $10 billion, not an insurance loss. So those things don't count. Okay? So I would say it's higher. Another thing that doesn't count, the U.S. government backstops flood insurance. What does that mean? If you're an insurance company, you, have, you collect premiums, but then there's a massive event and your premiums can't cover it. So the federal government comes in and says, we'll cover the premiums. And you're supposed to make up for it later on. OK, so after Katrina, they were never able to make up for it. And then there was Irene. And then there was Sandy. And there were a bunch of other things. And, the, and every time they don't make up for it, the US taxpayers sell treasury notes and pays for it. So it's part of our national debt. So as soon as it becomes part of the national debt, it becomes part of the national debt, <laughs> right? That kind of stays there. So the national debt for insurance, flood insurance, is $26 billion today. That's not covered in this. There's all sorts of things not covered, OK? So the cost of this stuff is bigger. Um, Munich Re, natural disasters. The biggest ones since 1950. Look at the dates. 
There's only two in the 1990s. All of them, 2004, 2012, 2011, 2005, all the ones in orange are weather-related. Hmm. One wonders. Uh, so, so it appears that violent storms are increasing. This is a 50-year record. Okay, so let me make an analogy. This is what I call, what I just showed you is what I would call epidemiology of climate change. It's not about climate modeling, making predictions and comparing whether they're true or not. It's just, hey, what's happening? And, oh, yeah, the temperature's increasing. <laughs> All right? It's sort of like, hey, what's happening? Between 1900 and 1960, the number of, of cigarettes smoked per male per day went through the roof, up by 30-fold. World War II, GIs get cigarettes in their knapsacks. Okay. And uh, by 1960s, medical community knew that this is bad for you. It, it's associated with lung cancer. And they started a campaign to stop advertising on TV, then uh, magazines, and so on and so forth, and really turn down the consumption of cigarettes in males. There's a delay of about 20 years, whereas there's an onset. It takes about 20 years, to, on average, for the average person smoking to develop lung cancer, and it, too, turns down. Now, during this whole time, uh, the industry was saying there's no proof that cigarette smoking causes cancer. But by this time, it wasn't about cancer. It was about heart disease and high blood pressure. And by this time, it was about kidney disease and diabetes. So it's, um, but there was no proof. But it went down. Okay. 20-year delay, because you can set off mutations that might take 20 years to hit. So what does this have to do with climate cl change? Well, there's a delay in climate change. We don't know how long the delay is. Why is there a delay? Again, amount of sun, and we only know the amount of sun energy hitting the Earth for the last 30, 35 years due to satellites. Because we monitor the visible, the infrared, ions, sunspot activity, radio frequency, everything. And it has an 11 year cycle, but the baseline is flat. So, so over the last 30, 35 years, the baseline is flat, but the temperature has gone up. Um, what's happening? The atmosphere heats up, the land heats up, the surface ocean heats up, the bottom of the ocean stays cold. When I spent a couple months in, um, down in Houston uh, helping stop that leak, the uh, temperature at the well site, at the wellhead, one mile deep, was about two degrees above freezing. The surface temperature was 86 Fahrenheit. It stays two degrees all year round. This is a deep ocean. It's a mile deep. And so it's going to take somewhere between 50, 80, maybe 100 years to come to equilibrium to heat up the cold ocean. So the amount of carbon dioxide and methane and everything else that we've put up there is slowly heating up this huge capacitor, this huge thermal mass. And so we're, we're going to glide to a temperature we're not really sure about but I can guarantee you it's warmer than it is today because of that ocean. And the, the mixing time is of scale 50 years. It could be 80 years. Okay? So the damage that we've done today will not be seen for at least 50 years. So it's something else like analogy to smoking. You're smoking. 20 years later, you get lung cancer. View this as a personal choice. We're smoking. Our grandchildren get lung cancer. That's a difference, OK? So it's amazing how people react to that. Oh, in that case, it's OK, <laughs> is the usual reaction. <laughs> I also like, and I couldn't use these analogies when I was Secretary of Energy, my public affairs would just die. <laughs> uh, and then the White House would kill them if they didn't die on their own. <laughs> Uh, I use another analogy. It's called Russian roulette. But it's not that you're pointing the gun at your head because, you know, if the temperature goes up four, five degrees, uh, you know, life goes on. Human life will go on. Polar bears actually will make it through. 
Not many of them, but they will. <laughs> There's paleontological evidence of that. Uh, you know, in a world of seven or eight billion people, you know, a billion might not make it, or two billion, but, you know, human life will go on. It, it distorts the world. Uh, and so I would liken it to Russian roulette, but you're pointing at your knee, Cap, not your head. And every decade, you put in another bullet, and you pull the trigger. And a decade later, you put in another bullet. Now, you can debate whether we got one, two, or three bullets in the chamber, but after four or five more decades, it could be fully loaded, okay, if we're cruising the way we are. Again, uh, I think I see Brandon in there, back there. I don't know if I do. But, uh, uh, yeah, the press of Paris people would have died by now. Um, so these are IPCC predictions of very strong uh, carbon emission curtailment, kind of business as usual. Uh, we went up by 0.8 degrees in the last 150 years, but this is going up perhaps by another two with some error bars up to four. And there's an old expression. Uh, uh, so we have a, a current, current trajectory. There's a good chance of going over five and six degrees, not by 2100, because we're, the glag path is another 50 or 100 years. So you've got to be thinking 2200. And so... So it doesn't stop. There's a mental thing. I've been trying to get the climate guys, and I know the climate scientists here, say, do calculations beyond 2100. Do it to 2300. Because the economists do discount rates to 2300. (laughs) (laughs) And how much, how silly it is to invest in climate change today. So do the damage to 2300 or 2200. Oh, but the uncertainty is large. So make the uncertainty is large. At least give people an idea of what might happen. Okay, so if we don't change direction, we'll end up where we're heading. Yogi Berra should have said that. But <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now let me quote uh, one of my favorite auth- set of authors. And it's, Our ability to find and extract fossil fuels continues to improve, and economically recoverable reservoirs around the world are likely to keep pace with the rising demand for decades. This was said by... <laughs> me and Arun Majandar in an eight-page Nature Perspective article we wrote in 2012. Let me show you why this is. This is U.S. oil production in 1945 to 2009, 10, 11, 12. And this is Alaska. This is the remainder. And this is tide oil due to hydraulic fracking, hydraulic fracturing, and horizontal drilling. What happened in 2013? We went to 7.5 million barrels a day, up by 1.5 million barrels a day. In 2014, we up, went up by another million barrels a day. And so, and it's continuing to rise. If you include our ethanol, we are the largest producer of transportation liquids in the world, including Saudi Arabia. If you exclude ethanol and just look at natural gas liquids, that end up uh, as refined into transportation and oil. We're second only to Saudi Arabia, but we're ahead of Russia. That's crude production, U.S. crude production. This is a prediction by a group of uh, investment advisors of the United States natural gas production, 1945 to uh, 2008. So anything over here is actual, and then they were forecasting to go down. This group changed a while back, and they said during the last three years, the firm has earned a reputation for accurate forecasts of major changes in oil and natural gas prices. And so what happened? Uh, meeting actual forecasts. So remember again, this is the forecast. That's what happened. Um, so uh, uh, they got to get that off their website. And <laughs> it's still there. Uh, so it went from a 57... Uh, billion cubic feet a day to 85. Now, with the price of gas below $4 uh, an MMBTU, uh, they don't look for dry gas. They, uh, gas is then associated with natural gas liquids or oil. But at $4 and above, that's the threshold. They go back to looking for dry gas. So uh, there are a lot of reserves in the United States. Um, there are a lot of reserves around the world. So in addition to the United States, uh, Canada has some, uh, South America has some, 
China has some, Eastern Europe has some, everybody has some. What's some? Uh, some is uh, potential proved and unproven reserves in the United States, 664 trillion cubic feet. Uh, conservatively, an increase of 38%. The rest of the world, uh, an order of magnitude more. And then if, if those reserves per, turn out to be extractable, um, maybe up by 50%. So it's uh, real potential. Uh, the technology races forward, and so we also are finding much better ways to extract oil as well. So we're not going to be running out of um, gas and oil or coal. Um, so to quote another person in the Sheikh, Imani, uh, the Stone Age came to an end not for the lack of stones, and the Oil Age will come to an end but not for lack of oil. If it did, we will be cooked. If we get, extract all the oil, all the gas, all the coal, forgetting about the coal, just all the oil and gas out of the ground we can get, we will be cooked. And so what happened is we transitioned out of the Stone Age because we went to better solutions. So let me just briefly say better solutions. Energy efficiency, a big deal. This is the levelized cost of refrigerators before standards, after standards. Levelized cost of refrigerators, including the electricity bill, but everybody knew, the economists certainly knew, that when you put on standards, you'd raise the price of the appliance. And there it is. This is the price of the appliance. Note the price rise. It solved the same learning curve. Every time you double number of shipments, you're going down at a power law. You're going down exponentially in, in uh, price because you get better at manufacturing. Better insulation means smaller compressors, so on and so forth. So that's refrigerators over a 60-year period. These are room air conditioners before standards, after standards. Uh, this is the price of the refrigerator before standards, after standards. Oop, why did that happen? That's impossible. How could putting standards lower the initial price? More efficient compressor, cheaper compressor. OK? Um, clothes washers. Oops, happened again. This is a two-parameter fit. We didn't say where standards started. We just asked the data to say, did something happen? If so, tell us where it happened. So open circles before standards, after circles, and these are increasing standards because you have to constantly update because the engineers get really good, they meet it, and then you got to update it again, and then you got to update it again. And it happened with central air conditioning as well. It happened in the United States. It happened in Europe. We submitted this paper to science, got rejected in science. Uh, uh, the most remarkable review was, it does, this is, one reviewer said, this is amazing. This guy, be get out there. This, this, you know, is against everything we've been assuming. And another economist said, it doesn't matter what these guys say. The economists aren't going to believe it. <laughs> so they may not be scientists. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about energy in data centers, mobile communications, and box ops. Just want to tell you that uh, if you look at the amount of electricity actually used to perform a calculation in a big computer, um, even when it's not really thinking, it's on and it's using energy and then therefore using cooling. And McKinsey reports between 6 and 12 percent of the electricity is actually used to perform a calculation, not used to run a fan or an air conditioner. Or something like that, okay. And um, and typically, uh, an additional, you know, in that overhead is about thirty to fifty percent of the cooling is used to cool. Uh, the world's record is owned by Google. There's something called the power usage effectiveness (PUE), and it's one point one three. What that means is you look at all the electricity going into the servers and including the cooling and everything. And if you exclude the substation they have and the generators, just the data center, the air conditioning, and everything else, and you say what goes onto the boards versus what goes to everything else, their overhead is 6%. I said, this is fantastic, Larry, Larry Page. You've got to tell me about this. How do you do it? Because I want to do this in all the computer centers around the complex. 
And he thought about it a little while. And first he said he would, and then they decided it was too good a company secret. It's money. Uh, now, I'm happy to say that the LBNL data center has a PUE of 1.1. It was very simple. I said, if you don't get this to be really good, I'm not going to sign off on this building. I am not going to support it for the DOE. Read my lips. <laughs> and then they remarkably got interested in energy efficiency. But they weren't before. They, they were thinking 30% overhead's great, you know, so on and so forth. Another big gap uh, in mobile data, internet traffic, and the energy use. If you go the way we're going, uh, the networks will be uh, increasing by 2020, the energy usage by uh, 27%, and it becomes a significant part of electricity use. Uh, if you look at just internet traffic and mobile, it's a few percent now, but it can easily go to 15% of all our electricity if you don't do something dramatic. In California, moving water is 22% of all our electricity. Pumping water in wells and an aqueduct system. So you got to watch out for this stuff. Uh, also, the chips themselves, uh, you want to consume less power. I can brag a little bit about a former company I was on the board of. Um, this is a little bit unfair, because they're comparing slightly older models of PlayStation 3 and Xbox and they have certainly graphical processing unit horsepower in some units, 240, 192, 365 for the Tegra K1, 100 watts, 100 watts, 5 watts. So you get a real desktop graphics machine on an iPad or an iPhone now. But that same graphical power, as Oak Ridge knows, is in your supercomputers. Uh, the GP GPUs are also there. And so they're dropping power dramatically. Uh, that was my big thing when I was on the board for five years. This is 10 years ago. I said, flops per watt. That's the figure of merit. Flops per watt. <laughs> and it's the figure of merit. I haven't joined their board back, and they want me, but I'm busy, so I have to decide. Money, time, money, time. Yeah. I've always made the bad choice in the past. <laughs> I've chosen. Um, I'd rather have the time. Uh, my former head of public affairs, Dan Lesikow, wrote me an email and said, Steve, you should be very proud of this because I know you pushed this. There's a big announcement in the Department of Energy. U.S. Energy Department, pay television industry, and energy efficiency groups announced set-top box conservation agreement will cut energy for 90 million U.S. households, saving consumers billions. <clears throat> and how much do they save? Well, by 2017, they'll save about 10 to 45 percent. Now, two years, at the last two years when I was Secretary of Energy, I said we're going to have to regulate these set-top boxes for cable, for satellite, for fiber optic, because they use a lot of electricity. If you have a DVR, it uses about 50 watts. If you have the other kind, it uses 40 to 50 watts. You put your hand on it, it's always warm. Um, and so I said, why can't you go down to a couple of watts? Say, they say, well, you have to leave it on because it's downloading programming information. I say, no, you don't. You have a little crystal oscillator. You wake itself up at 3 a.m. in the mor morning. You download the programming information for five minutes, and you turn itself off again. Okay, that's the... 100 milliwatt event for five minutes. <laughs> uh, and then you can really put itself to sleep. Uh, they even keep the hard disk spinning. When you think you've turned it off or put it on standby, you just turned off the LED. <laughs> so, um, so then I got home, and I, I got cable TV. We don't, uh, and they're all warm. They're all toasty warm. And so I said, I just, you know, I put my hand, hey, they're really warm. So I was looking at this. And oh, by the way, then I was discovering internet TV and all this other stuff and looking at how you can get the internet, the downstream, and go wireless to your TV. And what's the standby power of that device? One-tenth of a watt. Hmm. I overestimated what you could really do. <laughs> OK. So now, then I started looking at this a little more. I started chatting up the Comcast guys uh, because there was something, I, if I wanted an extension, I decided I was just going to go wireless in the end. And I said, well, you know, they consume a lot of power. And I said, yeah, 
That's because they take the old electronics, they put in a new box, and they just put it up, and they put a new label on it. And it's the old electronics, because they don't want to spend money on the electronics because it works. And heck, you know, they want to save money. And so I looked at my uh, nameplate of the model number with the DVR. It was a Motorola box. Looked at the serial number, Googled the serial number, couldn't find the serial number in the Motorola thing. Googled around a little bit more and said, oh, that serial number's fake. The real serial number is at the bottom. It's an older model, <laughs> the paper one, you know, with the SN number and everything. And, uh, and, and the guys at uh, the cable company said, yeah, they just put in a new box. The customers want a new box, but they're going to use the electronics as long as possible. They're not paying the bill. How much is the bill? Well, in my house, uh, we have three of them. We didn't use all four, so it's roughly 100 watts. You do some arithmetic. You say at a 15 cents a kilowatt hour, it's 130 bucks a year. But you, they're not paying for it. You're paying for it. Okay? 90 million customers. You do the arithmetic. It's 12 billion dollars a year. That's equal to 10 one gigawatt nuclear power plants, or more than all the coal plants in Ohio, to run those set top boxes, because they're not paying for it. And and so I was crushed when the Department of Energy settled. Because if I was secretary, I would have said, no, no way. But if you have, and you're dealing with people who either don't have the courage or don't have the technical ability to say, no, that's garbage, you settle. And that's what happened. Batteries. Good news story. 2008, batteries cost $1,000 a kilowatt hour. By 2012, dropped in half. Uh, we have two DOE targets for automobiles, $160 a kilowatt hour and $100 per kilowatt hour for utility scale storage, maybe in 2022. So the question is, are we going to get this? Well, let me tell you right now, if you're a battery company and you're producing batteries at this cost, uh, and six battery companies asked me to join their board, so I know a little bit about this. I, of course, you can only join either zero or one. But, but in any case, uh, their business plan is if we can't make them to sell them at 250 in five years, we're out of business. Okay? So that tells you the expectation of industry and the cost. Uh, Yi Shui is a very brilliant electrical engineering professor at Stanford, uh, and he was the founder of Ampers, one of the new battery companies. And he and his colleagues were one of the people trying to convince me to go on the board. And, and so if people who know me, you know, I said, well, okay. But we started talking about, well, you know, I've often wondered, why can't you do this and why can't you do that? And each one said, hmm. And then we started brainstorming. And anyway, uh, that led to one thing led to another. So we're now collaborating on batteries. Um, and uh, new designs of three-dimensional nanostructured batteries uh, uh, they'll be useful for lithium air, lithium sulfides, and care. They'll be useful in many respects, and they have a possibility of increasing the energy density by um, fourfold or more. But uh, we'll see. It's too early to say. The methods we're thinking of and using are very inexpensive. They're not exact nano stuff as in IC circuits. It's really simple, stupid stuff like coding polystyrene spheres. Um, but we'll see. Uh, I promised Yi I would not tell him of our ideas. But we did submit a paper to Nature and got rejected. <laughs> you know, it's the usual. This paper reflects original work, and that is nice and original. It's hard to see it's applicable to the real world, because we didn't immediately get up to the performance level of the batteries. It was just the start. Clever piece of work, but, you know, it's more suitable for Nature and nanotechnology or other nanojournal and blah, blah, blah. So I have the distinct honor of being rejected from more different fields of science than just about anyone in the world. <laughs> Biology, economics, atomic physics, condensed matter. It's, that was what I was saying in my tombstone. <laughs> Clean energy sources. And this is a, kind of a radical departure, and it's a 30 or 40-year view, but I like being a little radical. Is it obvious that we're going to have to completely turn our back on natural gas or, or fossil fuel in general. Well, it's not if you can develop carbon capture and sequestration, but let me tell you a few insights. 
you want to have utilization at least for the first 20 years at the beginning of this because you can make money uh, with oil. But you say, but you're still bringing carbon out of the ground. It's still going to be horrible. For the uh, And so let me continue this line of thinking. So I unfortunately agreed to join another company because I believe it might work and it can help uh, to capture carbon at $15 a ton from both gas and coal. Now, if that works, then the whole cost of carbon capture, pressurization, piping would be $40. Uh, you can't do much about the cost of piping. And the amount of real estate that this will work in, we think is so small it can fit in existing coal plant footprints. No new footprint, uh, which is also a huge hang up. Now, suppose you can capture the carbon, use it for sequestration. Now, another technology is advancing very rapidly because I keep track of this is the mid IR, the fingerprint technology, uh, where you have very inexpensive diode lasers, you have very expensive sensors, dollars not even hundreds of dollars, that you can do remote sensing or quasi-remote sensing. So what's the fear in carbon capture? Uh, is you pump carbon dioxide in there, and it leaks out of uh, leaks, uh, faults in the strata or in poorly sealed oil wells. It's not going to diffuse out uniformly. It'll be scoring out little cracks. But if they do that, they can be seen. Just as you can see a gas leak on a crack in a pipeline remotely, very nicely now. It's spectacularly well with very inexpensive detectors. So the few, and similarly with fugitive emissions, by the way, if, if fugitive emissions are coming up in a badly sealed oil well, you can see that with remote sensing. It doesn't even have to be a ground sensor. In fact, it can be one of those four propeller helicopters that BB wants to deliver your Amazon dot com. You know, this little helicopter this big. So you can have ground sensors. Uh, now, why would an oil company want to have monitors or let you fly overhead? Because if they only recover half the carbon dioxide, and you can show in that field that half of it remains on the ground for 100 years, give them credit for that. Because after 100 years, it's mineralized. So, so then you kind of tip the balance give them credit for carbon capture and sequestration when it's really occurring. And environmentalists would say, well, we can't be sure, and you have to do an average. And I said, no, 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 you can be sure, because the sensors are going the right direction. And it's on a well-by-well -well basis. Wells are different. Another thing, if you make a building, you can make out of steel, the structural material. You can make out of concrete. You can make out of composite materials, plastic. Huge amount of carbon in steel making, in the coking process. Huge amount of carbon in the uh, cement making process. You've got to capture that, too. There's carbon emitted in the plastic making process. You've got to capture that. OK. Uh, steel, some of it gets recycled, most of it not. Concrete, most of it doesn't get recycled, or it gets recycled in low-grade filler or stuff like that. It can never be used again as structural concrete. Uh, and so if there was a price on carbon, $40, $50 a ton, it can change this tip, this balance. If you have non-biodegradable plastic, you sequestered it forever. Okay? Something to think about. You, in a car, more and more plastic. Separate out the plastic. Don't, don't burn it. <laughs> Separate out the plastic. Recycle the steel. Whatever rares are in there, take those out too. <laughs> And, and bury the plastic. If, if not recycle, bury it. OK, so, so again, these are things. I actually, when I think more about it and some technologies are coming along, $40, $50 a ton is probably all we'll need to, to, to capture and sequester carbon. Um, I'm going to not, well, very briefly, since it, well, since it didn't come out, I'll take that as an omen. Uh, the population is growing. It might peak 2,100 uh, at 10 billion, but oops, how is that? Just a minute. Okay, I don't know what happened. One more thing. I'm, good. I'm not going to tell you about my uh, phone. You can tell me after. I'm going to go back to the image. And those of you who heard me give talks before, you've heard this before, but so good to hear it again. Um, 
This is Earthrise, taken from the first Apollo mission that went around uh, orbit of the moon. And in the last orbit, the astronauts turned the capsule earthward and took this picture. And uh, Bill Anders, the astronaut who took the picture, said, we came all this way to explore the moon. And the most important thing is we've discovered the Earth. Now, since 1968, there's compelling evidence that we're changing the destiny of the Earth. And so if you look at this picture, this is a very bleak lunar landscape. This looks pretty good. And there's nowhere else to go. And so we have to remember that. I'm going to take a more cosmic view of this, and that's really very strange why it's doing that. Uh, why it's jumping in that way. And I'm going to tell you about um, what Cargill said in a movie called The Pale Blue, Bu Pale Blue Dot. It was uh, Voyager 1, when it was leaving the orbit of Pluto, he convinced the NASA engineers to turn it uh, earthward and take a last momentary picture of Earth. And let's hope that this... From this distant vantage point, the Earth turn down the lights, might not seem of any particular interest. But for us, Don't it's worry different. About me. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on the mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner, how frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe, are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known.
typical Steve Chu talk, right? So we have time for questions. Let me start by uh, a question which I've been itching to ask. Fair to assume that you're not missing Washington? No, I'm not missing Washington. Yes. <laughs> um, I still watch uh, PBS News, but strangely, I'm beginning to lose interest in that, too. Um, uh, a number of Actually, Arun and I watch Fox News more than PBS and other stuff. <laughs> Along with John Stewart. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> right. Uh, I actually watch more John Stewart than Stephen Colbert. <laughs> but um, no, I'm not wasting Washington. I'm, um, over the last three or four months, there's been a flood of really new ideas. I didn't talk about them. Uh, and it's very exciting um, to, to have this flood of really new ideas. I bounce it off of some colleagues that have some expertise I need, and, and they get very excited about it. So, um, for whatever reason, um, you know, the brain's still working and I'm come back. Um, I think it's, you know, sometimes when you're a faculty member, uh, it's, it's sometimes good to be, take a sabbatical, go into a very different environment, look at a very different field to rejuvenate oneself. And so what I've discovered, if you take a 10-year sabbatical, it's 10 times better. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So let's talk, we're talking to a national lab community You've seen the labs from a perspective, and for four years as a lab director, four and a half years as a lab director. Are we doing everything that we can to address what you were talking about? Well, I think I think one can always do things better. Uh, this is something, unfortunately, my parents pushed on me. You know, you know, uh, you know, you got a name. Well, what? <laughs> Why did you hang plus? But, um, but I, so here's what I think some of the things that uh, labs can do better. And it needs the recognition and support of the uh, Department of Energy as well. And that is, uh, from my experience at Bell Labs for nine years, if you have very good managers in the lab who really know what's going on uh, on a week to week basis, day to day, week to week, um, those managers can actually help guide the people in the labs, not by telling them what to do. When I was a manager at Bell Labs, I wasn't telling them what to do. I was saying, did you try this? Oh, this thing happened. You should talk to that person because that might be interesting. Also, sometimes people, when they um, get older, their raw creativity might fade, but their skills are still there. And they could have a very strong skill set, but the raw new idea might not be there. And that's part of, that's normal. Um, and then you could use those people to be part of that team that has that skill set. And I think the labs, including Berkeley Lab, uh, didn't always do that in the right way. Sometimes they said, well, if you can't get funding at UAE, well, maybe you know, you're going to crash and burn, which is terrible. Uh, because you're not using that talent in the right way. Uh, what I've discovered at Bell Labs, and what I learned at Bell Labs, and when I come back here, and when I came back to Stanford, uh, remarkably, uh, I, I'm not going to get laboratory space for, in, for a year and a half. Um, so I have to twiddle my thumbs. Uh, because space is very tight. And I got one small laboratory in the microscope room because Dick Sayers was so happy I came back. He said, Steve, take one of my labs. And that's the supreme compliment of... <laughs> in <laughs> and academia. That, right. In academia. And another... And another uh, Outside of a parking spot. Uh, <laughs> we don't get parking spots at Stanford. Right. <laughs> and another one said, you can have half of my laser table. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, just because we're happy to have you back. Uh, but, but uh, so very little startup money because I didn't think I would be creative anymore, so I didn't want to ask for it. And so uh, it turns out I, I do have new ideas. And so I started interacting with people. It's amazing if you have no money and no space, there's the only thing left to do is think. <laughs> <laughs> If, when I was at Stanford, when I left Stanford, I had about 25 people. 
I didn't spend all my time getting money. It came to me, so it was very nice. A budget of about two million bucks a year. I wasn't spending my time writing proposals. And, but it was the wrong thing to do in hindsight. But then I spent my time managing 25 people. Yeah. So I think I'm going to go with four or five. And then the rest I will collaborate with, you know, like with Tom Sudoff and Axel Brunner yeah. or Yishui, and, and say, I have this great idea. And they already built up the things. You know, this is one idea they didn't talk about. He got so excited about it. He took a senior graduate student and said, you've done that for a PhD. It's done for the next year. Work on this. And it had to do with biology and batteries. <laughs> okay. So, so when you start working with people who, who say, hey, this is really exciting, uh, you can move very fast. I learned that at Bell Laboratories. Uh, this is all the people's name goes in papers. So what? You know, you're trying to solve find the answer. Yeah. You're trying to solve a problem. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and then you can go, you can zoom. Yeah. And, and, and so that's another thing that uh, one can do better uh, yeah. in a university and in a national laboratory to really instill that so that the boundaries are, are, are non-existent. Exactly. Yeah, right. So talk a little bit about the BP oil spill. We've heard stories. We've read the, the Nature article. Um, take us through, you know, from the time you or Conan or somebody found out that there's a leak somewhere. Okay. You know. Well, uh, I think uh, BP found out there was a leak. <laughs> it was the explosion, I think, that That's tipped right. it off. A leak was a, an euphemism <laughs> for an explosion. Um, and so... Then what happened in the first week, I think a lot of people in National Labs started to wonder about it and crazy ideas were coming forward. Um, and then during, at the end of the, about the middle end of the third week, uh, second week, I said, you know, at that time, oil was gushing out. I think by then the deep water horizon had caught fire, drifted off, and sank. And it was just, just gushing out like crazy. Um, and I said, then they had remote oily operated vehicles going down a mile deep, uh, and they were squirting hydraulics into the valves. So in a deep water platform like that, in the wellhead, and the so-called blowout prevention platform, there are two bo control boxes, uh, yellow and blue, and they were supposed to, one was supposed to be the backup of the other that would, and all else fails, and you push the scram button, you, you, you shut off all the valves, including valves that shear off and crimp off the main stuff. And uh, they, when all hose breaking loose, they pushed that button. They weren't, they weren't sure the signal got down to those pods. And in hindsight, uh, and they actually during the leak, they found out one of the pods' batteries failed, the, back, the primary backup. But they were failing every time they took the uh, of prevention up for servicing. So down in the ocean, and they take it up and say, hmm, the battery, the battery failed. And they replace the battery. They put it down again. They take it up. The battery failed. It didn't occur to them it, it might not be the battery. <laughs> so, so they actually had only one pod <laughs> because there was a short or something that was making the battery run down pre prematurely. They don't know that. Uh, so they were squirting hydraulics. The amazing thing about this is the valves, there's, I was holding it closer to me because when the battery runs down, wouldn't, wouldn't have this problem with a new lithium ion battery from Ampers. <laughs> so anyway, um, so there's the center pipe where, and there's the drill pipe which drills and forces mud and the bite comes up the side. And there's a whole bunch of valves that close around and close up over the central pipe. You, you should be maintaining control over the drill pipe. It's a smaller pipe, and you can valve it up top. But the big pipe, you're worried about. And there's all sorts of pipes. But when all else fails, there are other valves that just go and shear off the, everything, including the drill pipe. And um, the amazing thing is these are hydraulically operated. They go closing like that. And as the valve closes this way, there's another thing on the low pressure side that goes and locks it in place. Okay, standard mechanical engineering. What they didn't have is any indicator to tell how far the valves were closed. None. Okay. 
This is on the low pressure side. Just like an indicator, like a little metal to see that you know, the piece of metal is this far in because it's a wedge shape. No indicators on the valves, only one pressure meter on this $20 million thing. Uh, it was amazing how ver no instrumentation was on something a mile deep that you could not touch with human hands. Okay, So I said, well, maybe you can use uh, a gamma ray source, cobalt 60. Uh, it's a nice sweet spot where it's the minimum uh, between peri-production and Compton's carry and x-rays. You can go through this much steel. I knew from my positronium days and shielding. And said, maybe you can take a little shadowgram of where things are. And the guys at the BP laughed at it for two days, you know, gamma rays, the Hulk, you know, <laughs> <laughs> which was filmed at LBO. And, <laughs> and then after the second day, they, they said, you know, he may be right. <laughs> maybe we can figure this out. And then the fourth day, they said, oh, we use this. It's commercial. <laughs> 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 and so then President heard about that, and then at that point he said, Chew, get down there and help him stop the leak. <laughs> Literally like that. So, so then, I, then I, uh, I talked to a few people, and I said, okay, I want a team of really smart people out of the box, not petroleum engineers, not oil engineers, but people who are kind of crazy, uh, who think out of box. And so I asked Steve Clooney, and I asked John Holder, and I asked a couple of people, and I, you know, Richard Garwin, mm -hmm. uh, Tom Hunter, Arun. Uh, we did get one petroleum engineer. We got a mechanical engineer, real crazy, from MIT, Alex Locum. Uh, it was a very smart group of people. And I wanted people who really wanted, because you're out of the manual range now. And I figured we wouldn't know anything about oil, but since you no longer could follow manual, what the heck. And now, in the first, what we could aid by having the diagnostic. But after that, we began to slowly discover that um, uh, we can actually de-risk a lot of procedures. And we started to add a lot of value there. Hmm. Um, uh, let me give you three examples, um, or two examples. When the deep water horizon started to go adrift, and what happened is this th it's a mile deep of water and another mile and a half of drill pipe. And so this, this boat starts to drift off, drift off. This steel pipe starts stretching, stretching, stretching. It gets like 30 degrees off. It's stretching that much. It's like a oh. big friggin' river band, and then it sinks and snaps. And the pipe goes, <laughs> okay. During that time, the blow-off prevention platform sitting in the bottom of the ocean is being bent, 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 and there's a elastomer, and it's get bent, 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 and it got so bent it got full stop at the maximum, you know, because they're designed to use GPS to keep it centered within mm -hmm. a few feet up there, and so now it's bent and locked by 11 degrees, and the whole thing's bent two degrees, and the other thing's another 11 degrees, and after we found that um, uh, it may be possible, there was a lot of debating about whether the well had been damaged and you could never seal it from the top. And BP was convinced it was, and uh, and they presented a scenario, and I said, no, there's another scenario equally likely that, and here it is, where the well's not damaged, but but it just gave the same readings when we were trying to do the dynamic kill. And after a day or two, they said, yeah, you're probably right, that's an equally likely scenario. And another day or two later, they said, that must be the scenario. <laughs> I said, no, the other scenario is equally likely. <laughs> Uh, their philosophy in this time was uh, hope for the best, plan for the best. <laughs> this is the way they drill for oil, too. And so, so, uh, so that was one. And then one thing led to another, and it turned out it, there was compelling evidence. And we finally said, you know, there is a good shot it might not be damaged. And we decided to put a ceiling cap on it to test it. And so if you put a ceiling cap on it and test it, uh, if there is damage, the oil shoots out, and it works its way up the foundation. And now, if it works its way up the foundation into the rock and leaks out, that could be bad news. Mm -hmm. Because then, if the oil is leaking out, starting from in, deep in the well, out into the ground, the seafloor, that's completely uncontrollable, and you lose the oil that the pressure will allow it to lose. And that could be a third of the reservoir. It could be like, it depends on the reservoir, or half the reservoir. 
the, re the good news is the reservoir was uh, um, about uh, uh, one and a half million barrels. Um, billion, million, billion, I forget, a lot. How many, <laughs> billion. Um, and uh, the bad news, it was had really low well resistance and you could lose a lot. <laughs> Uh, it was a very productive well, and so. But we did, so then there was this very nail biting time where some oil, other oil experts in other countries said, "Don't do this. The risk is too great. If it leaks out, it, it's lost. The, everything's lost. Uh, you know, leaking out 50, 60 thousand barrels a day will be nothing compared to what won't be unleashed." And uh, but BP by that time was convinced it was okay, good to go. So so I said put everything on hold, and we, our team said, it's okay, and they first really didn't like it, but uh, the CEO, Dudley, actually said, okay, we'll give you a day. And in the day, they said, well, let's find out about the rock formation. Let's find out what will happen if you seal the well and it begins to leak out. Is the ground plastic enough or not, whether it would self-heal, and how much time would we have to discover and then, and then if it's leaking out of the ground, you let it come up from the wellhead, then the, if it's really plastic or sandy, it oozes back, and then you're okay. And so we started saying, okay, we all have geo friends and people. You've you got 12 hours. Let's call around the world. And a good friend of mine was in Hawaii on a vacation at uh, 2 a.m. and stuff like that. And so we just started calling people. And we got the verdict we got back, which was actually semi pretty consistent, but people knew the geology of that, that area of the Gulf. They said, no, it will heal, but don't let it go more than half a day. But it will heal. So I said, at that point, I said, okay, we're willing to risk this, but boy, we're going to have monitors everywhere mm -hmm. uh, to look for it. And, um, and also, by that time, the National Lab people had done detailed calculations. You put this, I don't know, four-ton thing with a little bit of water buoyancy, but so it's four ton minus a little bit, <laughs> density one minus you know, seven minus one. Um, on this thing, it's tilted two degrees and another seven degrees, and they were doing calculations with this elastomer hold, mm -hmm. and they said, maybe not. Maybe not. So at that point, we said, you got to straighten it out. There's no way you're going to put that sucker on this. And there's a component of BP that just want to go. Let's go. <laughs> and uh, and so once they said no, you can't. Then they had to think of how to do it. It's like a regulation, you know. What I mean? And so they did it. They, and they, and then you get these little uh, inserts that are hydraulic, and they go and straighten it out. So then you're left with the two degree thing, but the the eight degree thing's gone. And so the elastomer is not stressed. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. So so we did things like that to de-risk. One of the bad things is. I said I wanted two monitors, one looking, because the most likely leak point if the well is damaged, the casing's broken, is it goes up through the fractured rock, because that's where the rock was weakest, that's where you drill. So you want to look there, but you also want to look at distance sites, and there are sonar ways of doing it, so tiny little gas bubbles can be seen, very sensitive with sonar. Uh, you have video cameras looking at the well, you have uh, sound guys on the well, so leak, you can actually hear it, you know, like a little, go, 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 go. Uh, sound, like you know in leaky plumbing. Uh, and so we were getting this all this monitoring, but I said I wanted two video cameras just staring at that. And uh, the chief, uh, senior vice president said, oh, come on, one's enough. Oh, I want two. <laughs> no, I want that. Give me two. <laughs> so they gave me two. Okay, Chu wants two, he gets two. So I says, I want the video feed for the cameras. And, you know, here's my MAC address, here's my this and that. And so I had to, I was, we'd go back and forth between questions. So I'm at home. It's in like midnight. And I've come, and we're working through, there's some security stuff about, you know, company secure stuff from BP and also getting through, it was a Department of Energy computer and all this other stuff. So I took a couple hours to work that out. And then finally I got the video feed. This is a live video feed of the video cameras. And what were they doing? I saw scenes of sand. They weren't even scanning around. I didn't see a wellhead. Chu wanted two cameras. We gave him two ROVs and two cameras. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, holy cow, I'm trying to help these guys. And so I told uh, Thad Allen, 
look what they're doing. <laughs> so he was, he was great. He walked in the next morning. He just read in the riot act. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Let's take some questions from the audience. Yes. You can slug it out in between. Hi. <laughs> uh, thanks for your talk. I enjoyed it. Uh, I'm a postdoc and a nuclear engineer here at the uh, the lab, and I have a question about what you think the role of nuclear power should be in combating climate change. It seems like a lot of the obstacles to expanding nuclear power are not really scientific. It's economics because natural gas is very cheap, and unfortunately, possibly issues with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, what do you think the role of nuclear power should and can be in the future? Okay. Sure. Uh, okay, first, uh, I've been very clear when our Secretary of Energy hasn't changed before or after. I think nuclear power in this century can play a very important role. I think uh, uh, in most cases of nuclear power plants, a 20-year extension is, is, is appropriate. There are a few ones that it wouldn't be. There are smaller and inefficient ones. You want uh, a few near very high population size for non- for not because, well, because it's near a population city and the people get nervous, and so it, they're going to be closed down. But the others can certainly, I think, safely be continued for another 20 years. And there were 50, you know, there's a swell of the birth of them in the late 60s, 70s. Uh, and they were designed with a 40 year license. Um, if you want to have nuclear power, uh, beyond this century, beyond the, the first two thirds of the century, I, you're going to have to do a few more things. And I was pushing very hard to get an experimental program going for a fast neutron reactor, um, like a GE prism reactor, uh, just to try it out. Uh, the NRC probably would take a long, long time to license it, but there's a way out. We could put it in Savannah River uh, or Oak Ridge and uh, use the electricity for a government laboratory, and then you don't need an RSC license. Uh, and just to try out whether, why do I want some fast neutron reactors? Um, with a fast neutron reactor optimized to burn down the long-lived actinides, you begin to decrease the amount of waste, uh, and in principle, you can decrease the amount by this reprocessing uh, a whole lot, roughly a factor of eight or ten. But you, I'm just trying to think, is that something of that scale, okay? And and the long-lived nacnides, especially things like Neptunium, things like that, you get you burn those away, and you turn a half a million year problem into a few hundred year problem, a few, to a thousand year problem. So. And, and if you get this, instead of use, we use 1% of the energy content of the uranium today, we, which means of the all uranium, it's mostly U-238, it's 3.5% to 4%, U-235. Um, with fast neutrons, you can take some of that, you can, you can take the U-238, you make plutonium, you b try to burn as much of that in situ. But so it is reprocessing, there's proliferation issues for sure. But there are other, uh, but, but if you went from 1% to 30%, that's 30 times the amount of electricity per unit waste, but then the, the recycling, well, at least a factor two or three down in size, but more like four or five, and a and, and much shorter lifetime. So that back end of the fuel cycle may change, but we, we have to do experiments. There are designs of fast neutron reactors, there's the light water kind, kind of fast neutron. There's sodium cooled uh, neutron reactors. There's a, a solid metal one that the Department of Energy did years ago, which was show, shown to be actually very um, safe in the sense that they, the physics said if you just lost all compare, all cooling, all anything, it glides to a stop. There is no thermal runaway. Uh, for a metal, not a metal oxide reactor of fast neutron type. So we are working with uh, Republic of Korea on fast neutron reactors, ex experimental program of the metal type. And it's a research program. Uh, I would like to see, but, but I think you would need something like that. Uh, 
Unfortunately, there are fears, and this is the other thing I'll, I'll stop. There are definitely fears of radiation that um, are real, in the sense the fears are real. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the backgrounds of radiation, uh, there is no background. I mean, the average exposure of Americans is about 350 milliram per year. Uh, but it actually varies by four or five, depending on where you live, because of rocks and the radioactivity in rocks and things like that. Uh, in the epidemiological studies, even when it's order of magnitude higher in places in India, there's no more higher incidence of cancer. So, so, so there is evidence out there that if you go to lower and lower threshold uh, exposures per year, it then begins to go sublinear, okay? The data we have is from Nagasaki, Hiroshima mostly, and very high exposure nuclear workers in the 50s. And then it's extrapolated linear to zero. But, but all the sublinear data is now just swept away. There's two more questions and then we will close up. Yeah. Uh, I'm working in geoengineering. Other than the uh, uncontrolled, sorry, I work in geoengineering. Um, other than the uncontrolled geoengineering experiment, which is conducting right now, there's um, the subject of geoengineering in less than five years has gone from science fiction to science fact. And the Ruskies in Moscow told me in 2011 that they would do geoengineering if they thought they had to on their own. Well, so. it depends on what you mean by geoengineering. Now, I, we've been doing geoengineering for at least a couple of centuries. It's called agriculture. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at the amount of land, uh, inhabit, not mountains, you know, it's not desert, uh, a large fraction of its agriculture of grazing, grazing land. Uh, deforestation is geoengineering. Reforestation is geoengineering. Uh, a little favorite type of mine, uh, wider pavement and white top roofs, that's geoengineering. That's a smaller scale, it's a few percent. Uh, those are pretty benign. Those are very benign. So I'm all for that. Uh, I, I'm not sure the geoengineering of the, some of the things I've t heard about, like sulfur dioxide in upper atmosphere or mylar, luminized mylar in space, is really going to work out all the problems. It cures some of them, but you know, sulfur dioxide also causes acid rain. Uh, it, it gets rid of some of the input of the energy, but you still have the carbon dioxide problem, which is an ocean acidification problem, which the sulfur dioxide also does. So, so I would be leery about using that. Uh, here's some geoengineering I feel more comfortable about. Uh, uh, it turns out that uh, plants. Uh, in collaboration with uh, microorganisms in the soil, actually do mineralize carbon. So they do carbon sequestration in the bulk matter of the plant, the tree or the crop, but they also mineralize as well, a little bit. And so doing modest things to induce that interaction between the microorganisms and the plant to mineralize a little bit more could be a very inexpensive way of mineralizing carbon in a very controlled way because it's on land. Uh, big algae in the ocean, a um, little bit squeamish about changing the genomes of the little phytoplankton in the ocean. They can grow more carbonate shells to capture more carbon. I'm really squeamish about too because, you know, that's messing with the ocean food chain. But, you know, in a timber forest, that we raise for paper and pulp or in corn and wheat that I think is okay. And we can try some of that. We do need a little bit more research on what to do. In the end, we probably will have to capture carbon out of the atmosphere because we are going to sail through 500 yeah. and 550. Okay. So one last word, and we should finish up because we have a schedule. During World War II, a group of uh, airmen had to land in Greenland. And a few years ago, they went back to get those aircraft, and they're under 264 feet of ice. If it's warming up, I don't understand how they're so deep in the ice. Is, is that a difficult question? 
Uh, well, I have to know more of the details. We have been making measurements of the average ice coverage in Greenland. I think if you, you're asking a local question, if you, you have something and then there's a glacier that descends on it, it covers up in ice, it, you know, that's completely believable. But let me tell you how they actually measure ice coverage in Greenland. It's really cool. Uh, it's not by taking pictures of ice sheets because that could, that could be anecdotal. So what they do is they have satellites. There's a gray satellite and there's another European one. And there are two satellites. They're paired that go around in polar orbit. And, and we've known since the intercontinental ballistic days that small variations in gravity actually change the satellite's orbit. So when you put two of them together and measure the distance between them to a millimeter or less distance as they fly over this, and if they fly over a big mass, it perturbs their orbit. By perturbing the orbit and looking at the distance between them, they can back calculate what the mass change is. And so in doing so, and they, it's polar orbit, so they get the whole globe. And what they found over the last 15 years in Greenland is that the ice mass has been declining it's so sensitive, they can see summer, winter, summer, winter. But on top of the summer, winter, summer, winter, there's a decline, but it's, it's declining at least quadratically. It's not a linear decline. It's accelerating. They can see this, the ice changes in any part of the world, in Alaska, the Antarctic, the Himalayan Plateau. Antarctica was believed to have want to increase in ice mass because there's more precipitation when the average temperature warms up. And if it's really cold, it's not going to go anywhere. It gets frozen. And contrary to expectation, there's a little part of Antarctica that did increase in ice mass, but there's a whole lump that surprisingly decreased. Uh, Himalayan Plateau, there's parts of it that remain the same, a little increase, and a major part decreased. That same technique measures water tables. And it's measuring shrinking water tables around the world. Now, there's a new mission that people are thinking of putting up that should have, with spatial sensitivity, should be two orders of magnitude better. In fact, it may use an atom interferometer, something I contribute to when I was doing physics. And in fact, the person making the proposal is a former student of mine, now a professor at Stanford. Uh, and they think, with all the practical noise things, they can get probably two orders of magnitude better sensitivity. Very important because that means you get satellite coverage of changing water tables around the world, as well as changing ice masses. And that's very important because of agriculture and other things. We are mining for water now. We're mm -hmm. unsustainably using water. And so, so I think these satellite measurements, you know, I'm not moved by picture, people taking pictures of glaciers like the one I showed. I, <laughs> that's anecdotal, as I said. <laughs> uh, I'm much more impressed by full global coverage. And, and, and that is something that I think is where the action is going to be. Uh, but let me just say that the evidence over the last 30, 35 years is not good on this time average thing. Again, anecdotal evidence is one thing. It moves people. But, but as a scientist, I'm saying over the last 35 years, things have been changing. And the ice masses, and there's a NASA website you can click on. It's a little movie. It goes into a parts of the world. And it shows there's a little pluses here. There's a little minuses here. The big minuses in Greenland. Big minuses in the southern part of uh, uh, Antarctica. Big minuses in Alaska. Okay? And uh, huge minus in a water table in India. The water tables in western United States also shrinking. Folks... Please join me in, in thanking Steve once again. Fantastic. Thank you so much.